Good evening and welcome to the Colorado College. Uh, I am John Horner, Chair of the Psychology Department at Colorado College. And I welcome you on this uh, lovely evening uh, to come out and listen to um, <clears throat> a talk by a very distinguished guest of the, the college. It is my honor um, this evening to introduce the lecture series. So you cannot hear me? A little bit better. Tonight's talk is sponsored by the Harold D. and Rhoda N. Roberts Memorial Lecture Fund for the Natural Sciences and the Sabine Fund for, the, for Psychology at the Colorado College. The Roberts Lecture Series was established by the Roberts family and friends in memory of Harold Roberts, economics major class of 1908, and his wife, Rhoda N. Norton Roberts, German major class also of 1908. The purpose of this lecture series is to support and enhance the teaching of science at Colorado College through visits and talks by scientists distinguished in their field. Past Roberts lectures include William Fowler, Nobel laureate in physics, Jane Goodall, world renowned primatologist, and apparently we also learned lover of dogs just recently. Stephen Jay Gould, acclaimed author and evolutionary biologist, Marion Diamond, noted neuroscientist, and Elizabeth Loftus, famed psychologist of remembering. To introduce tonight's speaker, I invite Colorado College's Bob Jacobs, professor of psychology and the neuroscience program to the podium. Don't, don't applaud. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, thank you for attending tonight's event. I, I will admit this is the most people I've seen in one place in person in the last two years. So uh, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm very happy to, to see so many of you here tonight too, although it was a pretty nice day out compared to last week as well as we told our speaker. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Lori Marino. She's a neuroscientist who is one of the world's leading authorities on brains, on the brains of cetaceans, which means whales and dolphins. She has hundreds of scientific publications on neuroanatomy, the evolution of the brain, intelligence, and cognition. In 2001, she co-authored a paper that demonstrated that dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors indicating that they have a sense of self not unlike our own. And then shortly after that, she also became aware of the welfare issues for captive cetaceans and decided to combine advocacy for cetaceans with her ongoing scientific work. With this new focus, she founded the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy, which is focused on science and scholarship-based advocacy for animals. In short, her goal is to use science to speak on behalf of non-human animals to ensure that they can exist free from human exploitation and abuse. To this end, she also founded the Whale Sanctuary Project, which is building a coastal sanctuary in Nova Scotia, where cetaceans from marine entertainment facilities can find a new home in a natural ocean environment. It would be an understatement to say that she is passionate about non-human animals. She cares deeply about them. And it has been my honor to have known her and to have co-published with her over the last five years. Tonight, her talk is entitled Dolphins and Whales, Minds Beneath the Waves. So please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Lori Marino. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, John. And I uh, want to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's really my honor. Uh, I also want to especially thank the Roberts family for this wonderful lecture series, the psychology department and Colorado College. This is my first time here. And it's 
I've had a, a great time and look forward to coming back. So thank you very much for coming. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about dolphins and whales. And I'm going to start with this. This is the brain of a bottlenose dolphin preserved in a jar, postmortem brain. And it was that picture or something like it that led me to study these animals for th over 30 years. When I was a graduate student, I was in the library and came across a book and I saw a picture of a dolphin brain and I was hooked. I thought, okay, <laughs> I could study that for a long time. Um, and, and so I spent uh, the rest of my career studying these animals. And I wanna tell you who they are. So there I am in my lab at Emory University uh, with one of those brains in my hand. And you can see the size of that brain. And I always tell people, you know, that brain in my hand would never fit in that head. And that's sort of an interesting thing that I found out. So today I want to explore this with you through five questions. First, where did dolphins and whales come from? I'll tell you the story of their evolution. How did their brains evolve? What are modern dolphin and whale brains like? Who are dolphins and whales? And my last question, which gets to my latest project, the Whale Sanctuary Project, is the question of whether dolphins and whales are the kinds of beings that can thrive in marine parks and entertainment parks. So let's get to where did dolphins and whales come from? Well, as you know, dolphins and whales are mammals of the order cetacea, cetaceans. And so they are firmly embedded in uh, the mammalian um, class. And if you were to take a closer look at the order, of dolphins and whales, cetacea, you'd find that there are two modern suborders, the odontocetes, toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and the suborder mysticetes, and these are the large rorqual whales. And there was a, a, another suborder that began the transition from land to the ocean, the archaeocetes, or ancient whales. And they went extinct, and I'll tell you their story. Now, cetaceans are most closely related to ungulates, hooved animals, particularly artiodactyls or even toed ungulates. And the closest living relative of modern dolphins and whales is this guy, the hippopotamus. And we know this from morphology as well as genetics. Today, there are about 76 different species of odontocetes, toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises in about six different families. So when you think about 76 species, we really only know much about maybe just a handful of species. We think about dolphins, the bottlenose dolphin, and the orca, the beluga whale, but there are some dolphins that we don't, we've never seen a live one. We just know they exist from uh, post-mortem tissue. Um, some of the beaked whales, for instance. Um, so this is um, a diverse group, but at the same time, they all have something about them that makes them a uniquely cetacean. So in order to answer the question, where did they come from? I want to take you back 50 to 55 million years ago uh, to this region, which is the Tethys Sea. 
because that's the region where dolphins and whales originated. And the first dolphin and whale to be found was found in an area that is now today Pakistan. And it looked like this. This is Pakasitas. Pakasitas, in this beautiful rendering, was a terrestrial animal, of course. And um, we know that this is a cetacean because of the morphology. And what's interesting, if you look at this animal, if you look at the feet, those are not nails on the end of those feet. Those are hooves. Okay, so that gives you the connection with ungulates. And Pachycetus, we think, was the first animal to go back into the water from being a fully terrestrial animal. And cetacean evolution is really one of the best examples we have of morphological transitions, evolutionary transitions. This animal, we have pretty much all of the, the transitional fossils, specimens, to show how they adapted to the water. So about 5 million years later, you have an animal like this. This is Ambulocetus, the walking whale. And this is a transitional form. You can see that this animal is starting to look a little bit more streamlined and so forth, has webbed, uh, appendages, and this animal could walk on land and swim in the water. And then by about 40 million years ago, you have animals that look like this. This is Dorodon, um, who is an archaeocy, member of this extinct suborder. And you can see clearly that this is an animal that is starting to look more and more like a dolphin. There's a few things I want to point out. First of all, obviously, the elongation of the body and the hind legs are starting to disappear. The tail is becoming more fluke-like. Um, you have uh, fins. This animal is completely aquatic. If you see the blowhole here, if these are the nostrils. The nostrils are start, have migrated from the end of the snout as if they are in a dog. Um, and they will eventually end up on the top of the cranium where they are in dolphins. That's the blowhole. And in Duradimes, about halfway migrated up. And the teeth were starting to change a little bit. So Duradime was one of the last of the archaeocetes, the extinct suborder. About 35 million years ago, the archaeocetes were replaced by early dolphins and whales, neocetes, neocedi. This is Xenorophus, an early adonisid, clearly a dolphin, right? It's an extinct dolphin, but nevertheless, this is clearly uh, someone you recognize, something you recognize as a dolphin. And a little bit later, more recent fossils uh, show animals look like this. You notice the blowhole is at the top. The teeth are more peg-like. Um, they're fully functionally. There's a there's um, uh, tail flukes. There's a dorsal fin. This is a dolphin. Um, this dolphin happens to be extinct, but this was one of the more recent dolphins that led to the modern forms. So to put all of that together. The evolution of cetaceans is really fascinating. Um, and these are just examples of some of the fossils we have. They started out about 50 million years ago as fully terrestrial hood mammals, became semi-aquatic, then fully aquatic. And then about 35 million years ago, the archaeocetes went extinct. And they were replaced by the early modern odontocetes and mysticetes. So they were not talk today we're talking about just dolphins and whales, not the big rorqual whales, but there's a parallel story for the large rorqual whales too. 
So about 35 million years ago, you have Xenorophis, and in the modern day, you have 76 different species of dolphins and toothed whales. So that's the general story about how cetaceans evolved, but I want to turn to something that has always interested me, and that is how did dolphin and whale brains evolve? Through all of that transition, what was happening inside? So I'm showing you this picture because it's one of my very, very favorite places in the entire world. This is the Department of Paleobiology in the Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. And this is, it's in the basement of, and it's behind the scenes. You, you, if you're a visitor to the museum, you never get to see all this. But I spent many months here uh, working on the issue of evolution of the cetacean brains. And this is just to, to kind of show there's, there's fossils all over the place. There's shelves of pull out drawers and there's all kinds of goodies in there. And, you know, here's one of those archaeocete skulls you can see. And so I was, I used to work all the way in the back there and there were dinosaurs and there were, I pull out drawers and there would be the skulls of fossil dolphins and it's like being a kid in a candy store so you you get all these specimens you know and and these are specimens of extinct dolphins and whales and how do you figure out what the brain was like 45 40 35 30 million years ago I mean, how do you do that well this is how you do that you use imaging. By that I mean different ways of imaging the brain. You have x-rays, computed tomography, magnetic resonance imagery. The imaging of imagery um, methodologies opened up paleobiology and paleoneurology um, as allows you to see inside fossils so in short, what do you do? Well, I would get a skull of an archaeocete like one you see here. I go take it up to the third floor where there was a computed topography imager and put it in the scanner. And computed tomography gives you x-rays, but in three dimensions and in slices. And this would be a, an example of the kind of image you would get by putting a fossil in there. And this whole area here, this dark area is where the brain would be. It's filled in with sediment and stone, but that's where the brain would be in life. So you can get images like that and you can digitally slice up the whole fossil and reconstruct everything that's everything that is the brain part and get 3D reconstructions like this. So this is a 3D reconstruction of the brain of a fossil dolphin. This is the back where the spinal cord would come out. This is the front. And you get that from adding all these images together and putting them together. And so we did this for something like 74 different specimens. We were able to measure the size of the brain, look at the shape of the brain and so forth. And this is what we found that as cetaceans evolved, their brains became larger and their neocortex became more elaborated, meaning the cerebrum became more elaborated. So if you look at an archaeocete brain 37 million years ago, here's the cerebrum right here. It's a small part of the overall brain. But as soon as these guys went extinct and the early modern dolphins came in, we started to see a ballooning out, a great expansion of the brain and particularly the cerebrum. 
This is a 3D reconstruction of the brain of Xenorophis that I just showed you. This is the front, this is the back, and here's the cerebrum. And you can see that the cerebrum takes up a larger portion of the brain than in the orchisetes. These guys had pretty average brains. Now these guys didn't. And as they got, as they evolved, the cerebrum started to expand even more. And this is a dolphin, a reconstruction of a dolphin of, that lived around 14 million years ago, Urinodelphus. And this is a modern orca or killer whale brain. And so I hope you can see the, the trend here. And what we did is we took all of these data and we wanted to find out, okay, exactly when did dolphins become so brainy, right? Um, what happened? Was there a gradual change? Was there a shift? And what I'm showing you now is some data from those specimens that we did computed tomography of. On this axis is a measure called EQ or encephalization quotient. And all you really need to know about that is that an EQ of one means you've got a pretty average brain for your body size, right? If you have an EQ of less than one, you've got a smaller brain than expected. And if you have an EQ greater than one, then your brain's bigger than you would expect for your body size. It's oversized. And those are the kinds of brains that are very interesting. On this axis, it's just millions of years. So we go from 50 million years up to the present. So what did we find? We found that archaeocetes, all of those guys that I mentioned to you, Duradon, they all had low EQs, encephalization quotients, pretty small brains for their bodies. They went extinct and the early modern the early forms of modern dolphins shown here in pink showed an, a significant increase in encephalization. And what that means is that their brains got big and their bodies got small. So we went from archaeocetes being big bodied, formidable animals with pretty small brains to smaller animals with much bigger brains. And this shift here took place around 35 million years ago. And then there was another shift, another increase in relative brain size in just one family, the delphinoids, about 15 million years ago. And here's all of the modern, here's all the modern uh, dolphins and whales. We don't think there's been a change in brain size or morphology or shape in dolphins and whales um, for about 15 million years. So they've been swimming around with the kinds of brains they have for at least 10 or 15 million years. And if you want to put all of this into perspective, we can look at the encephalization quotients of modern dolphins and whales, our own, our own species, and our closest relatives, the, the uh, great apes. And you can see EQ here, here's one, this is average. And so all of us have above average brains for our body size. Here is our species, humans, with an EQ of almost seven. Our brains are seven times the size you'd expect for an animal of our body size. And here are closest phylogenetic uh, relations, great apes, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees. They all have larger brains than you'd expect for their body size, about two and a half to three times larger. But what I found when I looked at modern dolphin brains and body size was that there were some who had encephalization levels significantly higher than even the great apes and closest to modern humans. And that was the white-sided dolphin, 
common dolphin, rough-toothed dolphin, a few of the dolphins who have brains five, four to five times bigger than you'd expect for their body size. So that's how encephalized they became. And that was something that uh, was unexpected. So let's recap this part of the story. Around 33 to 35 million years ago, there was a critical shift in the evolution of cetaceans, placing them on a path to becoming among the world's most highly encephalized, intelligent, and socially complex beings on the planet. They went from this, these are, this is an archaeocete, to this. Um, and the point of showing you that is to show you that social complexity, we think, is the thing that made the difference for them. Around 35 million years ago, why did these guys on the left go extinct as the new forms come in that were so different? Well, there was a change in the temperature of the ocean, a change in the turnover of prey availability, and that opened up a new eco uh, ecological niche that was met with the extinction of these small brain guys and bringing in these larger brained early dolphins. So in addition to being large, what are modern dolphin and whale brains actually like when you look at how they're organized? Modern dolphin and whale brains are a combination of derived, meaning evolved or different from the original characteristics and highly conserved characteristics. And I'm going to explain what I mean. Let's look at the neocortex. The neocortex is the part of the brain that I mentioned uh, when I told you about the cerebrum. The neocortex is a sheet-like structure that sits on top of other structures in the brain. Um, I'm giving it short shrift to say that it's involved in things like perception, thought, reasoning, problem solving, aspects of self-awareness, because you can't really characterize the neocortex in that way, but just to give you a sense. And this is the human brain. This is the back, the front, this is the cerebellum. And you can see the large cerebrum that we have, the large neocortex. Well, if I were to take your neocortex off of the rest of your brain and pull it out this way, it would be a sheet, right? And the reason it's wrinkled is because that's the only way you can get so much tissue inside the cranium. If I do that for humans and dolphins, I find something very interesting. On the left, you see a cross section through that sheet, that neocortex. And humans have a neocortex with six layers. Well, when you look at the dolphin neocortex, it's thinner. And they don't have a certain layer that we think is really important, but obviously not important if you're a dolphin. Um, layer four. So the human and dolphin neocortex are different in terms of how many layers they have. But when you look at the surface area of the dolphin brain, you find that the surface area is much greater than the human brain. So, You've got in the humans, you've got a thicker neocortex, fewer convolutions or wrinkles, and you've got a thinner neocortex for the dolphin, but a repetition of that in terms of surface area, a much greater repetition. And the question becomes, what does that mean in terms of processing? 
Now I want you to look at um, two different brains. One on the left is the killer whale brain, the orca brain, um, which is something to write home about. <laughs> and on the right is the humble human brain. Not so humble, but I want to point out a few things because this is very interesting. First of all, the orca brain is much larger. And so, but orca bodies are much larger than human bodies. So you expect that. But this brain is two and a half times larger than you'd expect. This, the our brains are seven times larger for our body. So we're more encephalized overall. But when you look at the surface, the neocortex, we have a very wrinkled neocortex and we're fond of thinking of that among the primates as this being, you know, something that is really important. But as I mentioned, the neocortex of many dolphins is more wrinkled. And that brain, the orca brain is the most wrinkled or most gyrified brain on the planet. Not only that, but this brain, the orca, has the highest corticalization level. And what does that mean? It means that the cerebrum accounts for a higher percentage of total brain volume in orcas than it does in humans. So if you want to say the cerebrum, the neocortex is doing interesting stuff, then the orca brain has more of that per size of the brain in proportion to the brain than the human. Now, here's a very interesting part of the brains of dolphins and whales that you may not know about, but I always talk about. It's called the paralimbic lobe. And the paralimbic lobe does lots of things. It's involved in emotion and memory and learning. On the left is, is a computer tomography section through a human brain. It's a cross section. So here's the top, here's the bottom, here's the wrinkled cerebrum. And I just want to draw your attention to this wrinkle here. It's a wrinkle that um, is called the cingulate sulcus and it delineates um, the paralimbic region from other regions. Now, take a look at that and then come over here to the dolph, the orca brain. This is a cross section through an orca brain, computed tomography, and you can see the levels of surface, the surface area of this neocortex much greater. But I wanna call your attention to this part right here. That's a part of the paralimbic lobe. It's a cross section through the paralimbic lobe. The paralimbic lobe, is not unique to cetaceans, but it has become quite elaborated, so elaborated that it has become its own lobe in the brain. The paralimbic lobe is highly elaborated in cetaceans, and it has dense connections between the limbic system that I'll tell you about and other parts of the cerebrum. Now, let's take a look at sensory input and integration in the dolphin, um, because this is something really interesting that we found a few years ago. On the left is the human brain. And as you know, sensory information comes into our brain through our eyes and our ears and goes up to the neocortex, the wrinkled part of the brain. And, Wherever it goes, that's called a primary sensory projection zone. It's the first place it, that information goes before it gets integrated with other information in the, in the cortex. And our primary visual areas in the back of our brain in the occipital lobe here. And information from our ears comes in here to the temporal lobe. That's our primary auditory projection zone. And there's lots of room between these two. And that, what that means is that 
auditory and visual information has to go through a lot of neural territory before getting integrated together. Let's look at the bottlenose dolphin. Um, for a long time now, we've known that the visual and auditory regions are in a completely different place on, uh, on the surface of this brain than in the human. The visual projection zone is up top here and it goes down the inner hemisphere cleft and the auditory region is right next to it. And that is called cortical adjacency, meaning that you have two projection zones, visual and auditory, and they're right next to each other. And I think you can imagine why that might be important for an animal who echolocates, right? Because when you're echolocating, you're actually going back and forth between visual and auditory information. And we know that dolphins form visual images of what they echolocate on. So it makes sense for their primary visual and auditory regions to be together. But, but a few years ago, um, some colleagues and I took a couple of brains of dolphins who were sitting in fixative for a long time. And we put them in a scanner, like an MRI scanner. But what we did is we did something called diffusion tensor imaging. And without going into the weeds on all of this, what DTI or diffusion tensor imaging does is it allows you to trace fibers, fibers from A to B. So we did that. And we traced the fibers going from the inner ear of these dolphins, we wanted to know, well, we, we expected them to end up all where the auditory system is there. But what we found instead was a second projection. So this is not a secondary area where this is literally a second primary projection region. There are fibers that go from the inner ear. Some of them go to this part here that we already knew about. And we discovered that some of them go here to what is more similar to where we have our auditory language area, the temporal lobe. So we discovered two primary auditory projection regions in the dolphins. And it leads to all kinds of interesting speculation about how they differ in terms of the kinds of sounds that they process and how they might be related. Now I wanna to turn to the limbic system. I mentioned to you that the dolphin brain is really um, actually a brain that has a combination of really highly different or derived characteristics and then really conserved characteristics. Um, so I've just told you about some of the really derived characteristics, the neocortex in the, in the cerebrum of the dolphin, you know, this different sensory map. Um, a lot of the differences in the dolphin brain and the human brain come down to the way information is perceived. Uh, they echolocate, they have uh, a different ways of processing sensory information. But remember, we're all mammals. And now I'm gonna to turn to the highly conserved part of the brain. And that is the limbic system. The limbic system is the part of the brain that really it's been conserved, has it changed much over evolutionary time and is therefore shared across a wide range of species. It consists of different structures working all together like hippocampus, which um, is involved in memory processing, the amygdala, which is involved in fear and anger, and the hypothalamus, which is the output for a lot of the hormones that are that come from stimulation of this and it's part of a whole cycle called the HPA axis or stress cycle. 
Now, I call this is the limbic system of a human, but, um, and Bob Jacobs and I have been looking at this for quite a while and studying this. It, it's really quite similar to what you find in almost every other mammal. And this is uh, from one of our recent papers um, showing uh, drawings of cross section through four different species of the limbic system, um, showing that this is a system that is found across a wide range of species. And what is different is maybe the proportions of some of the structures, but the limbic system is involved in memory and emotion and in humans. And there's no reason to believe that it does anything different than any of the other species. This is a cross section through uh, one of our recent papers um, where you can see the amygdala in red in the African elephant, the bottlenose dolphin, human, the rat, the hippocampus, which is involved with memory. Again, in four very different species, hypothalamus. Again, in four very different species. And these beautiful drawings um, were done by, I think Mackenzie did those, Mackenzie Tennyson, um, for our paper. And they're just a beautiful illustration of how you can take you know, four very different species, as small as a rat and as large as an elephant and find the same limbic structures in all of them. So let's recap this part. Modern cetacean brains are large and highly elaborated with a combination of highly evolved and conserved characteristics. They have five neocortical layers instead of six, they have a unique arrangement of sensory projection zones, but they have a conserved limbic system. And there are some measures of brain expansion that exceed those for humans, like surface area and some measures of neocorticalization, which are higher in orcas and other dolphins than in humans and in paralimbic elaboration. So again, here we see a brain that by some measures is more elaborated than the human brain, but also has some very highly conserved features. So who are these animals who have these brains? I'm gonna tell you about three different aspects of dolphins, modern dolphins and whales. The first is self-awareness. Um, as Bob Jacobs mentioned, about 20, more than 20 years ago now, Diana Reese and I did a study where we asked ourselves, can a dolphin recognize himself in a mirror? We knew that humans do of a certain age after around age two, and we knew that chimpanzees recognize themselves in mirrors, but we didn't know about any other animals. So we thought, let's test this in dolphins. And here you can see both of our subjects. Um, we found that in fact, bottlenose dolphins are capable of using mirrors to check out different marks on their body. Why is that important? Because when you look in a mirror, and use that mirror to check yourself out, you're saying, that's me. And so these dolphins, in their way, are saying, that's me. And that answers part, partly the question of whether there are other animals besides humans and great apes who are so closely related to actually have a sense of self. I. That's me. Now, dolphins and whales are also known for their social bonds and strong emotions. Dolphin societies are held together by strong family and emotional ties. 
They have a very prolonged juvenile period, just as we do. The parent-child relationship is incredibly strong. And we see this demonstrated in many different phenomena, in helping behaviors, um, where we see apparently altruistic behaviors across species in dolphins and whales, in grieving behaviors, where we see mothers carrying their infants who are sick or have died uh, for a very long period of time. And I'll tell you about one in particular. In mass strandings, where it could be that five or five or 600 pilot whales strand when only maybe one is really sick, but they all come in and they all stay in. And if you try to get them back out to sea, sometimes they come back in. So there's a, a level of cohesiveness there that we don't quite yet understand. Talking about grieving behaviors, of course, we don't know what goes on in the heads of any, any other person, let alone another member of another species. But this is Talakwa. She's a, an orca, a killer whale, who lives in the San Juan Islands. And uh, in 2018, she was became very famous. Why? Because she gave birth to a daughter who lived for about 30 minutes and then passed away. And she carried that dead infant for 17 days. And scientists all over the world who know orcas said, now this is just a tour of grief. She would not let go of that baby and in fact, her family helped her carry the baby when she went to feed. They shared food with her because she was spending, while well, she was getting thinner and thinner, she was spending all of her time just holding the baby up. And finally, when the baby just was so decomposed, she finally let the baby go. And although she carried the baby longer than most, we see this time and time again, not just in dolphins and whales, but in primates and many other animals, uh, but many dolphins and whales will carry their dead infants for days. They also have a level of social complexity. They have social roles, coalitions, alliances, we know that they live in complex social networks where individuals have various social roles and they cooperate to hunt. Their social complexity is such that um, Janet Mann, who's been studying wild bottomless dolphins off the coast of Australia for over 30 years has said the social Life history and cognitive features of bottlenose dolphins show remarkable convergence with primates and other large brain mammals, offering a powerful method for examining selective pressures that favored thinking, cognitive evolution, tool use, elaborate social network structure, extensive maternal care, behavioral plasticity, prolonged development, all of these characteristics that they share with us or we share with them. And traditions, cultural traditions. Dolphins and whales are cultural animals, meaning that we now have identified several different cultures in different dolphin and whale species around the world that are learned behaviors passed on through learning intergenerationally from one group to another. They have dialects the way humans do. They use different kinds of tools and they teach, not teach, but pass that on from one generation to the next through observational learning. They have different uh, kinds of prey. So if you're an orca and you live uh, 
in the San Juan Islands and wash off the Washington state. If you're a Southern resident, you eat Chinook salmon. If you're a transient, you eat mammals. If you're, if you're living here, uh, halfway across the world, you're eating stingrays. Um, nothing is set in, it's all learned. And that's just like it is with many cultural species, including humans. Now, this is a bottlenose dolphin who lives off the coast of Australia. And you can see this weird thing on the end of her rostrum. And what that is, is a sponge. And this is the sponge carrying club. Uh, we know exactly who started this and when it started and how it evolved because these dolphins have been watched for decades. It all started with a, a mother and these, these dolphins root around in sand and they get their rostrum really scratched up looking for things in the sand. So she tore off a piece of this soft, core, uh, soft sponge and put it on the edge of her rostrum and wore it like a glove. And now she root, and guess what? Then she passed that on to her daughter. And from there, it became quite the thing. And it's a culture and not all do it. That's the thing. Only a few of the dolphins in this group do sponge carrying. And now through careful genetic studies, it's been discovered that they're starting to diverge. In other words, if you're a sponger, you don't mate with a non-sponger, <laughs> okay? And vice versa. They're starting to diverge genetically. This is fascinating, right? This is a cultural tradition that is directing uh, the genetics of, of these animals. But that's just one example. Migratory culture, beluga whales uh, travel four or 5,000 miles every year to different areas. So now I wanna to turn to the last part of my talk because I hope I've given you some sense of who these animals are. It's impossible to do that in one talk. But they have large complex brains. They have social capacities that are very complex and we recognize in ourselves, they have cultures. Um, they are self-aware. And so, and they have, and they migrate to different places and they have different coalitions and alliances that they form. And so the, the question I want to pose to you is, just knowing even this little bit about dolphins and whales, do you think this is the kind of animal that can thrive in a tank? Life in the tanks, as I learned, because I used to do a lot of studies with dolphins in tanks and beluga whales in tanks, um, before I really learned what was behind all of this. What's life like in the tanks, in a concrete tank? Well, it's either too small and there's overcrowding or you may be living all alone. And even though it's against the Marine Mammal Act to keep a dolphin or whale alone by themselves, they, some of them do live by themselves. On the right, you see Kiska. She's at Marineland in Ontario, Canada. She's been alone for 11 years. She had five children, all perished. And uh, so now she just goes around and around that tank. They live in artificial groupings because there's no culture. There's no long standing cultural traditions that they fit into. They're forced to perform. They're forced to have contact with humans and the environments are barren. There's no stimulation and no choice. And it's what we've identified as an impoverished environment. You know, it's like any animal living in just a cage, right? There's nothing to do. It's an impoverished environment. And we know even humans living in impoverished environments, they suffer for it. 
They suffer in many different ways, including neurologically. And actually an orca at SeaWorld would have to swim the circumference of the main pool more than 1400 times to match the equivalent distance traveled in the wild in one day. Now this is a big problem because there are over 3000 whales and dolphins and porpoises living in concrete tanks around the world. In North America alone, there are 480 bottlenose dolphins, 70 belugas, 21 orcas and, and many other species. And for many years now, I've been looking at the scientific evidence for what the well being of these animals is like in the tanks. It's not enough to just say, oh, I see them in the tanks on the marine park performing. I don't like it, so therefore it's not good. You really need to go into the scientific data. Um, and there's a lot of science published on these animals and their well being in marine parks compared with in a free ranging situation. And these are the things that we know about what happens to dolphins and whales living in impoverished environments like tanks. First of all, they suffer from systemic opportunistic infections that come from chronic stress. Pneumonia and other lung diseases are the number, that's the number one killer of, of captive dolphins and whales. Fungal diseases like candidiasis, gastric ulcers and other stomach diseases, encephalitis. They're all dying of this, these, and it's not like animals in the wild don't die from these, but what's killing them in the tanks? They have 24 hour veterinary care, chlorinated water, they're fed, they're in a closed system. And you must ask yourself then, how come they're dying of these opportunistic infections? We see common signs of mental disturbance, stereotypies, behavioral stereotypies, repetitive behaviors that really don't serve any purpose. Things like circling, 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 self-mutilation, damaged teeth. His, um, this is a picture of Kiska, that, that orca, her teeth, and well, what's left of them, you can see. She's worn her teeth down to the gums. 60% of orcas in captivity have teeth like that. And it's because what they do is they grate their teeth on the hard surfaces over and over and over and over again, jaw clap. Um, and that's a stereotypy. And when you see a stereotypy in any animal, including humans, it's just not floating out there in the air. It means that there has been a change in the brain. It means that there's something that has happened to the brain. We also see banging of the head against the sides of the tank, as well as anorexia, logging behaviors, depressive-like behaviors, going off feed, things like that. Most dolphins and whales in the tanks are drugged up with anti-anxiety anti drugs, antidepressives, you name it, a cocktail. There are disturbed social interactions, a lot of hyperaggression towards each other and towards trainers and visitors. Um, orcas have a long track record of killing and severely injuring people. And there's not a single instance of an orca in the wild ever harming a human. And there are people who swim with them. It's not like we don't get in the water with them. I have colleagues who swim with them all the time. We also see poor parenting, failure to attach and thrive, which is just multi-generational. And we see low survivorship and high mortality. Most orcas and beluga whales live about half as long in captivity as in the wild. And so I hope I've given you an idea of the 
the things that I've learned about these animals and what they suffer in concrete tanks and why I felt it was so important to try to do something about this, to try to find another way for us to relate to these animals rather than keeping them in concrete tanks, forcing them to perform and having them literally dying of stress, chronic stress. So in 2016, I started the Whale Sanctuary Project. And I thought to myself, well, there's elephant sanctuaries and primate sanctuaries and everything. There's no sanctuaries for captive dolphins and whales. So, I mean, when you see them in the tanks, you can't just grab them and dump them in the ocean because they won't survive. They don't have survival skills. They need to learn how to be a dolphin and whale. They, they don't even know a live fish is food. So the, the thing we can do is offer them a life that it's more like a natural life, more like the life they were meant to live, but certainly not anywhere near what they need. And so I founded the Whale Sanctuary Project with several colleagues and uh, we work generally to transform the way we are relating to these animals by creating seaside sanctuaries, assisting with international marine mammal rescues. We've done rescues in Russia um, and advancing whale and dolphin science. An authentic sanctuary, as I was talking about with several of my colleagues at dinner is a place that has some very specific characteristics. And if you go to a sanctuary for dolphins or tigers, if you can take a picture with a baby, animals, not a sanctuary. If you can go somewhere and ride on the dolphins, it's not a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place where you want to provide the animals with a, a, an environment that promotes their autonomy, their choice. How do they spend their day? Um, no performances, no breeding, no unnecessary invasive procedures. A place where you can do authentic education, conservation, and be totally transparent about why they're there. Don't have to make up something about how happy they are to be performing. And I want to introduce to you where a sanctuary is going to be. After two years of going up and down the coast of North America, we found a beautiful little bay, not little, big, <laughs> expansive bay, on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. So here's Nova Scotia. Here's Halifax, the big city in Nova Scotia. And if you go about two hours from there, you come across a, a bay called Port Hilford Bay. And here's what it looks like. This is the site of the first seaside sanctuary for belugas and orcas in North America that we are creating. This is Port Hilford Bay. And it is a big, beautiful bay that opens up to the ocean where we're going to give a home to about eight belugas and two to three orcas um, who come from marine parks. This is a rendition of what it's going to look like when we finish it. It's over a hundred acres. That's 150 times larger than the largest tank in the world. And these animals will be cared for, they will be fed and they will have full-time veterinary care, but they will get to spend their days the way they want for the first time in their life. Not only that, but they will be in an environment that has some stimulation. It won't be concrete barren walls. There'll be fish and lobsters and crabs and other critters on the floor. There'll be birds um, and they will have more space than they even know exists at this point. And so we are working hard to 
welcome our first residents by next year, spring of 2023. We're well into to permitting, design, um, and anyone who's up in Nova Scotia can give me, send me an email, and I'd be happy to show you the site. It's a big, beautiful, expansive bay. And I look forward to the time when um, we can show that there is another way to relate to dolphins and whales rather than seeing them as performers and therefore our use is to give back a little bit to what they've given us for so long. And of course, we will be doing all kinds of interesting things. We'll do education, we'll do outreach. We're gonna have veterinary internships, um, interesting science that comes from this. This is going to be a place that catalyzes innovation in science and animal care. And so I hope that uh, you will come up to visit next year when we have our first residents. And I thank you. Well, we have time for questions. There are two microphones. Uh, you're welcome to walk up to those or John has a microphone he can bring to you uh, if you want to ask a question. There's someone, she has the microphone and then. Hi, um, so in terms of replicating this project to create more opportunities to help more animals, how difficult was it to find appropriate locations that kind of met all the habitat accessibility and the political um, requirements for doing something like this? Very good question. And the question is how tough is it to find this beauty spot? you know, where it's a, a, a beautiful bay that has all the right physical properties for beluga whales and orcas, if those are the species you're dealing with, or bottlenose dolphins. Um, there are two other organizations that we collaborate with. Um, one has um, a facility in Iceland for two beluga whales. The other is the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and they are preparing seven of their bottlenose dolphins for a site that they have found uh, in Puerto Rico. That's not enough because there's they're breeding them all the time in the tanks. Um, it's difficult, but not impossible. And the thing we found very briefly is. It's one thing to find a beautiful bay where you could envision these whales thriving, but it has to also be near a community where they accept the project and embrace the project. We happen to find that in the nearby town of Sherbrooke. These people are incredible. Um, when we went there and said, is this something that is in, of interest to you? Do you have a bay in your area? that you could suggest, they embraced us and we fell in love with them. And to this day, we are, we are collaborating, working together to make this a reality in, an, in Port Hilford Bay. So there's political stuff, there's physical stuff, but around the world, I mean, there's a lot of efforts and we're just starting. We just are starting to develop accreditation standards for cetacean sanctuaries because they don't exist. And so this is the beginning of something really new. Yes, I was just wondering what keeps the belugas and the dolphins from leaving the sanctuary? Well, what keeps them from leaving? Well, there is a net that goes to the bottom. So I guess you're asking, why don't they just jump over the net? And the answer is that they don't. Now, I don't want to be make light of it or be facetious. I, they literally don't. When you see these animals jumping through hoops, 
jumping from here to there in a marine park. You can't imagine the amount of training that they have to go through to get them to do that. Even to get them to go through a gate. Oh my gosh. You have to coax them, you have to work with them. They're not going through something. They're not jumping over something. It's too scary. And they don't do that. Um, now we have a lot of contingencies in case something like that happens. We don't expect it to because it has never happened. Um, even animals kept in sea pens, dolphins and whales, they don't jump over. The poignant part about this is that around the world where they do these mass, these drive hunts, like in Taiji, Japan, they drive the animals in and then they encircle them with a net. Why don't they just jump out of the net? They don't, they don't. And that's one of the mysteries. Hello. Hi, I have two questions. So um, are you gonna take the orcas and belugas out of the concrete tanks or are you gonna do like sick orcas from the ocean? Oh, good question. We're not gonna take them from the ocean because we, they're happy in the ocean. <laughs> we want them all to be in the ocean. That's where they evolved over 50 million years and where they can thrive. Um, so we're not a marine park. We're not gonna capture animals and put them in captivity. We're going to take those that are already in captivity at marine parks and transfer them to a more natural environment, to a sanctuary. So that's, that's the whole purpose of that. And this is my dad's question. How did you select your two species? How did we select your two select species? The two species? Well. We looked around. So the three species that are kept the most commonly around the world are bottlenose dolphins, beluga whales, and orcas. And the, there are people working on bottlenose dolphin sanctuaries. So we thought, well, what about the belugas and the orcas? And in fact, belugas and orcas do the worst in the marine parks. Their well-being is rock bottom. Bottlenose dolphins do a little better because they're smaller for some reason. They're not doing great, but if you, we, I decided let's go with the two species who do the worst in the tanks. And there are other people working with bottlenose dolphins. Thank you, Renee. Hmm. How many animals are Dolphins are in the world. Can you repeat that? How many dolphins are in the world? How many dolphins are there in the world? Oh my gosh. I don't know a lot. <laughs> um, it's a great question. And it really depends upon the kind of dolphin, right? So some dolphins like bottlenose dolphins are really plentiful. You find them everywhere. And they're generally doing pretty well. Other kinds of dolphins are doing less well, like the vaquita, um, the little porpoise. Uh, there's only about seven left um, and everything in between. So some are doing well, some are endangered and everything in between. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I was just wondering, um, in all of your research, did you do any research on shark brains um, to compare to like dolphin and whale brains to kind of see how the, how the wrinkles formed with a more cohesive um, species versus a very like, what's the word? Not sedentary, but isolated or singular kind of. I, you know, the question is, have I ever compared shark brains and dolphin brains? I actually haven't. I mean, I've looked at shark brains, but I've done no studies of them or anything. And, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's int the interesting part about your question is it's not whether it's shark or dolphin, but fully aquatic animals, right? So 
if you look at, you know, seals, sea lions, manatee, you know, the whole in the whole question of living in the aquatic existence, like, does that have some, um, does that mean something for the brain, whether you're a fish or a mammal or so forth? That's an interesting question, but I haven't made that comparison. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about the candidates that you have coming to your sanctuary. Mm -hmm. How is it that they get to be the candidates that are coming? Oh, well, we like don't... who's giving them up? Who's saying like, yeah, they can go. <laughs> um, you've identified that the answer, the question is how are we gonna get whales to put in the sanctuary, right? Then marine parks are not handing them over readily. And there's a whole politics to this, right? And we really want to work with the marine parks to collaborate to do this. We don't want to shut them down. We don't want to do any of that stuff. We, and the reason is, is because they have the animals and they know the animals, the trainers and the people who have been working with the animals, they know the animals the best. And so we want to work with them to bring these animals to a better uh, situation. Um, most of the marine parks are staunchly against this. They claim that this is not a good idea and they have all kinds of reasons. There are some who are starting to see that they're, they may be interested in something like this. And then there are others who are being forced into that situation because they, the people decided they don't want to see this anymore. So we have two beluga whales in South Korea who um, may, with talking with them, who are candidates, right? We don't know if those are the ones that are going to come initially, but that's because they're closing down that those uh, parts of their park because the people don't like it. And they have two beluga whales, two fem young females who are alone in separate parks. So can we do something with them? SeaWorld, they're far from ever doing anything like this, but we hold out the hope that maybe they'll come to the table at some point. And then there's many other facilities that we're talking with. We haven't identified the specific individuals yet, but they will have to be candidates in the sense that we'll have to know how healthy they are and whether they have the kind of profile that will allow them to thrive in a facility, in, in a sanctuary. Um, kind of goes back to the question about like, why won't those animals jump out of the demarcation of the sanctuary? Would you think that could be a kind of condition that they're like conditioned when they are in the trap already so that they're now like, they couldn't jump over their inner fear to like to, to the outside world? If I hear you properly, let me know if I don't, you're asking if, the not jumping over the barriers could be conditioned? I don't think so because when you, if you capture dolphins in the wild who were never trained to do anything um, and you encircle them with a the net, they don't jump. So it's something inherent in their psychology. I think time for one more question. So sorry, my dad and I have what, two more questions. <laughs> my first one is, uh, I think a majority of us know that the blue whale is the largest whale um, and therefore the largest animal on the planet. Mm -hmm. But is there a largest dolphin species? Yes, the orca. Well, and let me, let me qualify that. Dolphin species, right? So orcas are delphinids. They're a member of the dolphin family and they are the largest dolphin. Now, 
in that suborder of toothed whales, dolphins, there's the sperm whale, and that's the largest odonocy. Well, thank you all for coming out, and please. Thank you.